1 Corinthians chapter number 11. I'm going to begin my reading at verse 23. And I'll conclude my reading when I'll finish. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. When you get it, please stand upon your feet if you're able. And I'll note to begin with the reading. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 23. As recorded in the Bible, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. I want to read 27 finally. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body, blood of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of God. Repeat the sermonic prayer with me, please, Father. Father. Please bless the preacher in the preaching of your word. Bless me to hear, do, and grow in Christ. As a result of receiving your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. For a topic on today, I didn't put out, like I said, I don't put a lot of thought into topics because I want to put all of my brain power into what I'm going to be preaching on. But if you need a topic on today, uh, so let's just simply go with a, a, a communion sermon. Is that, is that all right? A communion sermon. I understand that we are in the midst of our loop challenge. And uh, I think today is December the 5th, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So we should be on chapter number 5. The challenge is, of course, uh, to read one chapter every day up until Christmas. And we, by the 24th, on Christmas Eve, we have, uh, we would have, we would have, we have read. <laughs> we have read um, the entire Christmas story according to Luke. By Christmas Eve. So uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, even if you haven't started, you know, double up and read and get caught up. Uh, it's, it's, it's really fascinating, even the chapter uh, where they were calling all of the names out. You know, it's very interesting to see uh, the lineage of, of, of Joseph. Amen. And, and what really dawned on me during that reading is, is that 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 God taught Jesus to his 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 stepfather's side of the family even more than he did Mary's mm -hmm. because Jesus had to be born through the lineage of a king and David uh, was, was you know, y'all y'all read it, I mean <laughs> move on, but I thought that was very very interesting and it, it, it has been a good read, amen? amen. So uh, I, I do appreciate all of you who have accepted the challenge and like I said you can, you know, mix it up, get somebody to read for the entire family or, or you can listen to it on audio uh, I thank Sister Charlene for putting the uh, audio link on the, on the, why don't you take it down? Put it the <laughs> I, went to, I went to look at it, and Charlene has embraced the message. <laughs> Usher, you may retire. God bless you. Let's give Usher a round of applause. But Charlene, if you can put that back, you know, because I, I actually listened to a chapter while I was reading, because I still like to read it. But I also listened to it while I was reading, and that that was good. You know, keep it fresh, keep it interesting. Don't 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 get uh, don't get sidetracked by how many verses are in the in the in the chapters. Amen. Just just read it anyway. And you know, I'm saying all of that to say this. Um, I had planned on preaching from from Luke and teaching from Luke while we were reading, uh, but I thought it I thought it more necessary to talk about communion on today, and I have a reason why. And prayerfully, at the end of this, this short sermon, you'll see what the reason is, because we, we have to be aware 
of what we're doing. Amen. Amen. There, there's a warning in this scripture about taking communion if you're not aware of what you're doing. Amen. Amen. Communion is not uh, just a snack after church Amen. Right? to hold you until you get home. And you can cause yourself more harm That's right. taking communion with the wrong mindset. Amen. You see how it's all working together. We have been working on, on, on our psyche. We've been working psychologically to think differently. Amen. So so we, we, we cause ourselves more harm than good when we take communion without the right mindset. Amen. Amen. Even as the pastor and the deacons, we can't approach communion as just to pass out uh, bread and juice. Amen. We, we also have to be locked in on what communion is and all about. Amen. Amen. Because when the leaders are locked in, there's a better chance that the body will be locked in as Amen. well. So communion is not something that you just casually do. Communion has deep and rich meaning, amen, and I want to try to shed a little bit of light on how we ought to approach the table, which we're about to do in a few short moments. Can, you, can everybody here give me just a few short moments to explain this to the best of my ability with an amen? Amen. Okay, thank you. So, we, 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 we come to this juncture in history and we see that everything is about to change. Jesus has been on earth for around 33 and a half years. He's taught in the synagogue at, at 12 years old. He, he's, he's, he's caused the, the blind to see. He's caused the deaf to hear, the lame to walk. He's done, he's performed several miracles. He turned water into wine at the wedding. Jesus has been very busy you know, during his three and a half year ministry. His ministry on earth was only three and a half years. That 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 means by, by the time Jalen went to high school and well you're a sophomore, right? Or your freshman? You're sophomore. My goodness. <laughs> that means like next year, that's that's the that's the amount of time that, that Jesus did his ministry on earth. It was only three and a half years. He did all of these things and more in three and a half years. Because the, book, the Bible says that, that there's no books that can contain the works that he's done if he was to write down everything that he has done. So here is the end of, of, of the ministry, the earthly ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the end of his ministry. And he's sitting at the table. I think you can find this over in the book of John, chapter number 13, around the, the, the 20s and the verses. And we'll see that, that Jesus at the Passover is sitting at the table uh, with the disciples. Mm -hmm. And understand the importance of the Passover because they were in Jerusalem and they were celebrating the Passover. The Passover was initially, initially when uh, the children of Israel came out of bondage in Egypt. You, you see, now, now, now some of you, you need to think about it. Some of us can still celebrate our own personal Passover now because some of us can think back and remember how God brought us out of a place of bondage into freedom. Amen. We, we were just hollering and shouting and clapping our hands because when the sun sets free, is free indeed. God has come to deliver you. Jesus, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has come to deliver you out of a place of bondage that you have, that the children of Israel was in bondage for a very long time in Egypt. And even after uh, they were released from Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, but God was still with them. Amen. I need to come and tell somebody before I move on that you may be in a place of bondage right now. You're fighting, you're scrapping, trying to make your way through, but I need you to understand that God God is right there with you. If I need some more examples, let me find three fellas out of the Bible. Let me see Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were thrown into a fiery furnace. They were thrown into the place where they were supposed to meet their fate. They were thrown in a place where the only way out was supposed to be 
death. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace, he said, Behold, I know I only threw three people in the fire, but when I look, I see a fourth man walking, and it looks like the image of the Son of God. Satan has set you up for failure. Satan has set you up for death. But when he took another look, this is football season, so upon further review, he looked and said, I know I sent them in there by themselves to die, but lo, I see somebody else walking through the fire. I see somebody else walking through the storm. I see somebody else there to rescue them, and it looks like the image of the Son of God. You are never alone in what you're going through. Amen. 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 So, so, so Jesus is at the table. Let's go back to the table. Because he's sitting at the table. And he says, he says, Jesus, if I, if I can paraphrase a little bit, because, you know, it's 21st century, and I don't know King James very well. <laughs> but he's, he's sitting there, looking at the table, and, 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 you know, Jesus says something ain't right. <laughs> Something's different at the table tonight. Out of all the disciples, I don't know what type of time all of them are on. Something's a little janky at the table. And at the Passover, we're here to celebrate. But something is off. Jesus says, I'll tell you what. He says, I'm going to take this bread and sop it. Y'all, we, we fresh off Thanksgiving. I know you know what sopping is. <laughs> so y'all did some sopping a couple of weeks ago. I'm gonna do some sopping today. <laughs> and, and 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 he said the one I sop and give the bread to is the one that's going to betray me. And then and then Jesus he he says to to Judas Iscariot because he's the one that he fed. So now the question has been answered: Who's going to be the one who can do something like this? And Jesus tells Judas his carry out. He says, don't take all day doing this. Because I have an appointed time to go back to the kingdom. He says, you're going to turn me over. You're going to have me killed. Don't take all day. The Bible says, he says, what you're going to do, do it quick. That's right. And, 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 and the Bible says, Satan entered into Judas his carry out. You can be as godly as you want to be. You can be as godly as you want to be. But Satan is always going to use somebody else to try to get to you. Because if Satan can't harm you himself, he's going to use the man sitting next to the man sitting next to the man. That's right. To try to get to you. So he entered into Judah. It's carried. That's why you have to be very careful. Very careful. Let me, let me just talk for a few moments. You've got to be very careful about not your enemies, but also the ones close to you. Amen. You know, there used to be a song that says you've got to watch the ones that's watching you. Because Satan allowed someone in, in Jesus' inner circle. Not the top three, but he was still in the inner circle. And he used him to turn Jesus over to the priest. Mm -hmm. Now I looked it up. He, he turned them over for 30 pieces of silver. And I had an inquiring mind. And I said, well, Judas must have, must have made Powerball lottery type of money for turning Jesus over to the priest. And I was so disappointed on what Judas' carrier set up for to turn over our Lord and Savior. But you also have to remember that God's will had to be done. And so I looked it up, Mother, and it said he turned them over for the equivalent of $197.40. Now, when I worked at McDonald's when I was 16 years old, I worked two weeks for about $186 and change after the government got their fees. You're going to tell me Jesus, Judas, his carrier, turned our Savior over for two weeks' wages at McDonald's. Let's put that into perspective. 
You can't even fill a small vehicle for $197.40. He sold Jesus out for some gas money. <laughs> this is tough. Amen. He sold Jesus out for little to nothing. Now, I pray that that was comical and entertaining, but what I'm about to say now may not be. Because folks still selling Jesus out now yeah, come on. for even less than what Judas' carryout got. Amen. People are, are sacrificing their relationships with God for far less than $197.40. Right. People are, are ignoring the power of God. People are ignoring the blood that was sacrificed on Calvary's cross because you are not honoring the sacrifice. Jesus. Right. Jesus. That's why when you take communion, you're causing damnation to your soul when you take it unworthy. Because you're selling Jesus Christ out for some chunk change. All right. Chunk change. You cannot say that Jesus is my everything. You cannot say that Jesus is the reason for the season. And then sell him out That's for right. a PS5. Come on, man. <laughs> sell him out for somebody who's trying to tell you that God is not real. And because they make you feel good and take you places and buy you things, you trade in your relationship with Jesus for a relationship with somebody who doesn't love you at all. That's right. You are selling Jesus out for nothing. Amen. So Judas is carry up. That's why, you know, we see in the Bible, I can't remember if he hung himself or threw himself headlong down the cliff. But anyway, he killed himself. Because I can, using my sanctified imagination, I can think he was sitting there. And he said, I turned over, my, turned my back, sold out the Savior of the world for 30 pieces of silver. What can I do with 30 pieces of silver? He said, I can't take it anymore. And so, Jesus is reminding the disciples. Let's go back to the table, okay? Jesus is reminding the disciples here. And Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. He says, you need to be mindful of these things when you come to the table. And if I could go verse by verse real quick before I sit down. He says, he says here that the Lord Jesus, the same night, the same night that he stopped. Now, I understand sopping and supping is two different things. The night that he sopped, as we all know, that is what? The last supper. And that night that he sopped, he said the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took a piece of bread. That's what symbolizes the bread is his body. And that's what we'll do in a moment. He said he took the bread and he broke it. Question is, why did he break the bread when he took it? Not only to disperse the bread among the table, but he took the bread and broke it because the bread symbolized his body that was broken for us. He didn't give him the whole loaf. He broke the bread because that bread was his body that we are healed by. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. Mm -hmm. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes. Mm -hmm. We are healed. Yeah. That is physical healing, emotional healing, yeah. mental healing, financial healing. Every type of healing that there is to take place with his stripes. We are healed. His body was voluntarily broken. So you wouldn't have to struggle all of your life with the same thing. If you are struggling with the same thing day after day, if you are struggling with the same things year after year, it is not God's fault because he sent his son. It is your fault because you are not accepting the healing when he broke his body. So as far as you're concerned, if you're not trying to do better, if you're not trying to make strides in your life, 
If you're just going to sit there and complain about the hand that you have been dealt, then he was wounded for nothing. Amen. He was bruised for nothing. He carries your chastisement for nothing. Because you are not believing and receiving that you are healed. Somebody shout in this room, I am healed. I am healed. He says, and then he gave thanks. He took the bread and broke it. And, and, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. He said, take it and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Why did he say take it and eat it like that? I, I, I understand that the disciples were not the smartest people in the world. But I don't think he, they, they were that bad off where he had to tell them to eat the bread. Jesus was saying, this is my body. And anything that you eat becomes a part of what? Your body. Jesus is saying, I want my body to be a part of your body. So take it and eat it, digest it, let it be a part of you. Jesus is saying, everything that I've done on earth, you need to understand what I've done and the things that you saw me do, you need to do. I need to become a part of you. He says, I'm leaving. It used to be a song, I'm leaving on the next train and never coming back again. He says, I'm leaving you. How long am I going to be amongst you? He says, I'm going to my father's house. I'm going to sit on the right hand side of the throne. I came and did all that I could do and I'm leaving. But I need a part of me to stay here. So you need to take on this bread and allow me to be a part of you. You see, when Jesus is in you and a part of you, you can't do some of the things that you like to do. Amen. Oh, now the preacher is preaching. <laughs> you have to sacrifice because that's what Jesus was all about. A sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. If Jesus sacrificed his life, surely you can sacrifice some of the pleasures in life that you that, that, that does not behoove a Christian. It's, it's getting a little heavy. It's getting a little heavy. But I'm telling you the truth. Amen. If Jesus is a part of you, you get convicted when you do certain things that you do. I don't think there's a need of itemizing sin on today. You know what you do. You know what it is that you keep asking God to forgive you for everything. I don't need to know. You know and God knows. Make a sacrifice to live holy. Amen? Amen. Oh, if you don't remember anything else, rewind to this part of the tape that says make a sacrifice to live hope. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is my body was broken for you. Take it eat. Do this in remembrance of me. I want to deal with that in a minute. And after the same manner, after the same manner, also he took the cup and when he had sucked, that simply means when dinner was over. Mm -hmm. We was talking about the other day, Selena and I, we would go to our grandparents' house. They put out this big plate of food. And, and, and you would think, where's the Kool-Aid? <laughs> where's the water? Where's the soda? Give me something. And grandma would say, you don't get anything to drink until I can finish that plate. So here, Jesus is done eating. Dinner is over. And this is so important because this is when he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup in the New Testament of my blood. So in order to understand what the New Testament in my blood was, and I'm closing, we have to understand what the Old Testament was. And you see, the Old Testament was in the olden days, brief history lesson, was in the olden days when the Day of Atonement mm -hmm. and the priest would have to go beyond the veil mm -hmm. for the people. Because no one could go beyond the veil except for the priest. And he would put on his robe and he would put a rope around his waist or around the bottom of his robe and they would have bells on. And the priest would go beyond the veil. And as long as the people, and the rope had a rope on it, and as long as the people heard the bells ring, they knew that the priest was all right. Because on the other side of the veil 
What's the most holy place? You had the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place. And so the priest was the only one to go in the most holy place. Are y'all still with me? The priest is the only one to go in the most holy place. And as long as the bells were ringing, they knew that the priest was upright and, 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 in, good, and in good standings with God. Because if he went beyond the veil and he had sin in his life and on his hands, then he would drop dead when he came into the presence of God. I'm going somewhere with this. And as long as they heard the bells, they knew that he was all right. But when the bell stopped ringing, they knew that the priest had messed up just like they had and had dropped dead. And they would take the rope and pull him back out because they still could not go beyond the veil. Jesus is saying, take this cup of my blood. And this is the New Testament. I didn't come to erase the Old uh, Testament, but I came to fulfill the New Testament. And the New Testament is when I hang on Calvary's cross and when I shed my innocent blood, as the Bible says, around the ninth hour of the day, everything is going to go pitch black and the veil is going to be rent from top to bottom. And when the veil is rent, that means Everybody, say everybody, all of us have access into the most holy place. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm excited about that because now I don't need my pastor to go in for me. I don't need my bishop to go in for me. I don't need the prophet to go in for me. I don't need mama. I don't need daddy. I don't need sisters or brothers or friends or prayer partners. I can go into the presence of the Lord. Somebody ought to clap your hands because you don't have to depend on anybody else. I can go into the presence of the Lord for myself. The veil has been torn. What separated me from the most holy place has been removed. This is the New Testament in his blood. And the, and, and the point of it all, this is my third closing, and the point of it all is we can come and, and you know what? I, I used to think this was scripture, and some of y'all might still think it's a scripture, but let me tell you, it's not. You can come as you are. Come as you are is nowhere in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's not, it's, it's come. But, Bible teaches that concept in principle that, 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 that you don't wait. Get this if you don't get anything else, along with what I said before. You don't wait to get clean, to come into the presence of God. He, he said in his word, he said, those that are sick have no need for the physician. You don't wait until you get over the sickness, the cough, the flu, or whatever, and then go to the doctor and say, I had a cold. You don't wait until you think that you uh, cleared all of your sins and got an empty slate and then come to God. You come to God as you are. Whatever baggage you're carrying, he says, come to me. Whatever weight you're carrying, he says, come to me. No one, I want y'all to listen here, and, and if you're looking at it virtually, no one is so filthy and dirty Amen. that you can't come to God beyond the Holy of Holy. Amen. He wants you to come. He says, come unto me. All that labor and heavy burden. He said, I'll give you rest. He said, your yoke is too heavy. Take upon my yoke. My yoke is easy. Who wouldn't want the easier way? We're always looking for an easy way out. Jesus says, I am the way. The truth and the life. It's all in the book, ladies and gentlemen. Everything I'm saying, it's all in the book. But don't go looking for come as you want. Because it's not in the book. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is the important part. Have I been preaching too long? No. I hope not. I ain't finished. Yep. He, says, he, says, he says, do this in remembrance of me. That's what's written on the front of the communion table. Do this as often as you do it. Do it in remembrance of me. Now this is why some people might wonder, why Assembly Chapel will do communion every Sunday? Well, every first Sunday, every third Sunday, like all the rest of churches do. Main reason is we're not all the rest of the church. That's right. That's the main reason. The second reason, and it dawned on me during the study, is because he's saying don't do communion as just a habit right. or a ritual. When you do it, 
you do it in remembrance of me. And when you do it to me, and this is growing up in other churches, when you do it, everybody knew at Mount Hermon, I think it was the first or third Sunday was communion. And we just, I just haphazardly took communion because it was, it was that Sunday to do it. And I'm glad we do it the way we do it here because it doesn't, it doesn't become pious. It, didn't, it doesn't become a useless ritual. And that's why y'all might hear this sermon every time we have communion and still come. Amen. Because he's saying, do this in remembrance of me. What does Jesus mean? I got two more points to make. What does he mean when he say, do this in remembrance of me? He says, when you take communion, be mindful of the blood that I shed on Calvary's cross. Be mindful of the beating that I took so that you could be healed. Be mindful of the diseases that I took on so you can be healed from them. Be mindful of the crime that I took on that you were going to commit so you can be made free. Be mindful of all of your sins that are blotted to the cross, separating you as far as the east is to the west. Be mindful of these things that I've done. Don't just come up here and eat no cracker and drink no juice and go on about yourself. Be mindful of what you're doing. When you, when you eat of that bread, remember that I was wounded and bruised. When you drink of that cup, remember that I shed innocent blood for the remission of your sin. I didn't, Jesus is saying, I didn't do this for me. I did it for you. You're the one that messed up. You're the one that sinned and come short of God's glory every day. I did it for you, so be mindful of these things. And when we come to the table today, when you have your communion, I want you to thank God, even silently, out loud, I don't care how you do it, but I want you to thank God for Jesus and the sacrifice he made. We wouldn't be at the table today if it wasn't for his sacrifice. And let me hit 27, and I'm done. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, drink this cup unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I've been mistaught. Coming up in church, I've been mistaught that this man, that if, if, if you had sin in your life, that you weren't supposed to take communion. If you hadn't uh, joined uh, your church, that you weren't supposed to take communion. That's not what Paul is telling the church at Corinth. What he's saying is, the way you take communion unworthily is when you don't remember him. If you don't know about if you don't know him, don't take it because you can't remember what he did if you don't know him. Amen. But he's saying that if you take this communion, if you take up this bread and take up this cup and not do it with me in mind, then you're taking it unworthy. What he's saying basically here, as I really close and we're coming to the table, deacons, if y'all want to come and, 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 and prepare the table while I'm saying this, if you take communion without Acknowledging Christ, you are not honoring the sacrifice, but you are sharing the guilt with the ones who killed you. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? You're not honoring the sacrifice, but you are partaking and sharing. You are as guilty. This let me put it this way. You are as guilty. If you take communion and not have your mind on Christ, you are as guilty as the ones, the Romans, who pierced his side and slammed a crown of thorns upon his head and hung him on that cross. You are as guilty as they are. You are as guilty as Pilate. You are as guilty as the one who falsely accused him of blasphemy. So as we come to the table, as we say goodbye to the virtual church, as we come to the table,